Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. First of all, I'm very sorry for being late, but uh, I arrived in Paris last night, and I knew that's the only day I can come to Berlin to see Mark, because we have to discuss, after all, our future projects. And of course, you know Mark. He told me, yes, but you give a lecture and then an interactive talk, and you know, and uh, OK, I said, fine. So I haven't prepared any talk, really. Um, <laughs> But I have to tell you, uh, for me, it is always very emotional to be here. And that is probably because Mark started to build up this institute, Institute for Cultural Diplomacy in 1999. And that was exactly the same year when I started to build up an institute for cultural diplomacy. And that was the Hungarian Culture Center. But what I did in 1999 in London was not promoting Hungarian culture as such, but I wanted to create a space, a culture space, where ideas, thoughts, religions, people, cultures could meet each other. And I was using my own culture, which is of course very rich uh, and very diverse, as a, as a sort of vehicle to bridge these cultures. So it was always more this institute was always more than just a normal, you know, you know, the Goethe Institute or the French Institute or that, that kind of institute uh, was supposed to be the Hungarian Culture Institute as well. Um, and I also have to tell you, it is, a, it is a great joy and honor to stand next to these flags. Because after all, this is all about us. I've got all these identities. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm very happy. Because after all, I'm Hungarian, I was born in Hungary, and of course, I, I can go back to the roots of my culture every day. And I have to tell you, I go back all the time. And that is why I'm saying it's very important, especially for young people, to know where they are coming from, to know their history, their geography, their politics, and their culture, and their language. I will talk about that later, that of course, this is what we've been doing in UNESCO, protecting all these things. But then I was very happy to step out from my culture and from my country. Of course, it was not so easy as it is easy today for many of you, because I was brought up behind the Iron Curtain. So of course, when I come to Berlin, I cannot not remember, you see, the wall. I was here on the Easter side. And it took me quite an interesting journey to come separately to West Berlin and East Berlin. So after the political changes in 1990, I was able to really step out from my culture and from my country. But just because I was so interested how we can be really interlinked and how we can really inspire each other. So I became, by now, a proud member of the European Union. And of course, here I am in Germany, but after all, at the moment, I represent the UN. So you see how many fantastic identities we can have, and they don't have to hate each other, and they don't have to be afraid from each other, and they don't have to bother about it. On the contrary, I was always fascinated in the idea of UNESCO because I don't know how much you know about it, but the whole concept of UNESCO is the celebration of diversity. Diversity in many sense, diversity in our surrounding, in the nature, in the forest, in the uh, biosphere, and so on. And of course, diversity in the sense of the cultures, the languages, the religions, the diversity of the people. And we, protect the diversity, because without protection, without protecting the diversity, I would always say that losing a language, losing a culture, it means that we are getting poorer and poorer in the world. Of course, it's not very easy, because we live in an interconnected village, I would say today, in the whole world, which of course gives a great beauty and enjoyment to all of us. But it is also a great challenge how we can keep the different identities and how can we at the same time be open and interested in the other people and the other languages and the other cultures. 
I don't know, I am really interested, and that is the, the second very important point for me when I come here. I'm always so inspired and interested in the audience because there are always wonderful young people. And very often I can learn a lot, so I hope I can do that today as well. Because we are actually at UNESCO working for you. Probably you don't know about that, but that's really the main point. We are trying to create a better world, a safer world, and a more secure world for the future generation. The whole idea, of course, came after the Second World War, and the idea was a very idealistic idea. And I would say UNESCO is a bridge between the idealistic world and, of course, the reality. I don't say that we are naive people there, especially um, because it is an intergovernmental organization. It is the biggest special organization within the, Europe, uh, within the UN system. But of course, we are all representing governments. We ambassadors are representing governments. But it's an interesting lot there, because we all know that after all, representing the interests of your country and of your government, as you are an ambassador, you have to do. We have to be a little bit above that all the time. And that is the beauty of multilateral diplomacy. I'm sure you are all interested in international uh, affairs and relations. And of course, as we look around in the world, I personally believe and I'm very happy for that because I've been working for that for 30 years, that multilateral diplomacy and cultural diplomacy are getting more and more important. And not only getting more important, but they are recognized to be more and more important. So UNESCO is a place which is a, a great ground for multilateral diplomacy, but which is really a great place for cultural diplomacy as well. After the Second World War, the idea was, of course, to um, build the idea of peace in the thoughts of the people, of the young people, and of course, of the enemies as well. And originally, it was opened in London, and originally, it was declared by then a lady who was the wise um, minister of education of Great Britain. I'm saying that because for me, it is quite symbolic that it was declared, it was opened by a lady. Having said that, after her, we were only three who ran the general conference, which is the supreme body, of course, of UNESCO. So we still have to do a lot of work in UNESCO. But after the declaration, and the opening of the whole institution, uh, Leon Blum, who was three times prime minister of France, invited UNESCO to Paris. And we were given a beautiful grant. And that time, of course, the idea of creating a new space and a new building and a new place within Paris was also a statement. So this is, a, I would say, a, a, a great two listed building, and it is a very modern, it's a very famous Ypsilon building. So by today, the UNESCO building is one of the most uh, famous modern architecture uh, buildings in the world. And of course, the number of the members has been growing and growing. Because don't forget, UNESCO had to assist and to inspire and to follow and probably also was able to influence of the, the whole evolution of humanity. Because after the Second World War, uh, UNESCO was growing because of the independence movement of the different countries. Um, more and more countries joined us. And of course, it was the time of the Cold War. And that was a different time in the UN, and it was a different time in UNESCO. In the UN system, we have so-called electoral systems, and how interesting it is that even today, we have this Cold War type electoral system, meaning the group one is the Western countries, 
and the United States, Canada, uh, Turkey, and Israel. In the group two is the former Soviet Union countries, the former Yugoslavia countries, and all the rest, like us, Middle, Southern, Eastern Europe. And uh, then group three is um, the Caribbean countries, and group four is Asia Pacific, and in group five we have two uh, groups, the Africa group and the Arab group. So when we think about the UN or when we think about UNESCO, we don't think about Europe only, or we don't think about the Arab world only, or we don't think about Africa only. But still, we have special priorities. And we have got two very special major priorities, sort of midterm priorities in UNESCO. One is Africa and the other one is the empowerment of the women. Um, the vehicles in UNESCO, the way we work, uh, are based on the conventions. And of course, because the institution, this organization was set up in order to build peace and security with international collaborations in the fields of culture, education, the sciences, communication. Of course, all these topics influence each other. And I think this is a beautiful thing that today you, can, you have to face, that you can't speak only about culture or only about education or only about sciences or only about communication because everyone is working together with each other and UNESCO gives a place for that. And actually this is uh, another reason why all these special uh, projects are focused uh, in, the, in the Paris headquarter. Now the way we work is that we have the headquarter in, um, in Paris, this is the main building, and then we have got regional offices all over the world, and of course we have the so-called national um, uh, UNESCO commissions in the member countries. So we work a lot with the civil society, we work a lot in partnership. And if we talk about diplomacy, this is of course, look for partnership, and somehow UNESCO main reason is to find the consensus. Now, today the world is in quite a rotten uh, situation, we know that, but I would say it has been the same all the time. We had ups and downs, but actually the main point is that we would never give up what we believe in and what we've been working for. Because after all, the so-called evolution is a very long process, but we can see the results. Now, why do we say that UNESCO is the base of culture diplomacy? It is because, uh, what is culture diplomacy? Uh, we will talk, I think, a, a little bit later about itself as art or music or poetry as a vehicle of culture diplomacy. But culture diplomacy is not really organizing events or, or producing uh, festivals or concerts because these are the elements what we are using for a purpose. And of course, uh, we can never concentrating. Uh, we can never concentrate on uh, organizing the best or producing the best concert because then you go to Carnegie Hall or Festival Hall or Sal Player and so on. So, but you can use these wonderful vehicles, which can help us really to get together, to get a, a, a bridge amongst each other. And of course, we will talk about that later how these vehicles can really lift up the spirit and help the better understanding among the people. But in UNESCO, culture diplomacy means that we have got so-called conventions. And as this is an institute for culture diplomacy, I'm not going to speak now about the side of education or the sciences or the other uh, parts of UNESCO because uh, then I will come back and I will talk about later. We don't have uh, time for that. But in culture, we have got so-called conventions. What are those conventions? 
conventions which have been produced together in a consensus with and by the other member states. And of course, that makes these conventions really very important because UNESCO doesn't uh, have a kind of uh, power of a police. Um, it's, uh, it, nothing happens in, if a country or a member state doesn't do what UNESCO is offering or suggesting or advising to do. But still, we are working on these conventions so that all the member states which ratified the conventions would act according to that. We have a very important uh, convention which is called um, Convention for the Protection of Intangible Culture Heritage. This is the youngest convention and I'm starting with that because it's only 11 years old but it has grown into one of the most important conventions because it talks about the identity, what I just mentioned at the very beginning of my talk. It is to protect everything which is in music, in dance, in craft work, in um, verbal, uh, his oral history, and which is a living, kind of activity somewhere in the world. I work quite often and quite a lot in Africa. And in Africa, if you go there, you see this is the whole continent is intangible cultural heritage. But they don't know it. They don't know that they have to be protected. They don't know that their intangible culture has to be protected. So that is why we are concentrating very much and working very much hand in hand with the African countries. And um, you, I am sure, know that there is a huge debate in the world. And this debate is always between the North and the South, meaning the rich countries and the poor countries. And this is an ongoing political debate and fight. It can be sometimes very harsh. It can be sometimes um, more understandable and so on. So. Because of that, I would say that this is a very bad concept when the so-called developed world would go into the developing world telling them what to think, what to do, how to behave, how to live, you know, what kind of value system to have. Because I truly believe that we, re we have to learn from each other. Uh, going back to Africa, I've been... Um, totally inspired by an African philosophy, and it is called the Ubuntu or Ubuntu philosophy, because it says that you are a human being because you belong to a community. You belong to somewhere. It's not only about you. And of course, we in Europe, we think always about our own ego. So why don't we learn, for example, from this African philosophy? But of course, I could give you many more examples. The main point is for us in the whole world, and of course in the work in UNESCO, that we should be open um, towards each other and we should be ready to understand and to learn from each other. I would always say that if we have got the good grounds in our childhood, in our youth, then we should be not afraid uh, in this chaotic and unsafe life because we, we, we know first we know who we are and then we can work with the other cultures and other people. So this is a very important convention which has been already uh, signed by 160 countries. Um, actually, all together at the moment, there are 195 countries. Another very important declaration, what we did in 2001, it is also quite new, it is the protection of cultural diversity. And that was the very first time in history that the protection of cultural diversity uh, has been put on a very high diplomatic uh, rank, I would say. And of course, um, mainly all the countries signed this uh, convention. And again, it gives a kind of vehicle and an advice to the governments whom we've been working together with, how to protect the diversity of cultures, of languages, of uh, religions, of the biosphere, and so on. Uh, 
Um, we, I'm sure you know, create all kinds of different international days. And these international days are just uh, a, another kind of vehicles uh, working with each other. And this is, for example, the International Day of the Mother Tongue or the International Day of Jazz, which I declared actually in 2011. And of course, uh, the director of this uh, wonderful institution wrote his thesis about jazz. So it was not a it, it, it was not a mistake that we declared the International Day of Jazz, and it was not only because Herbie Hancock sort of inspired us uh, to do that, but because it always had a very strong political message. And I remember uh, the years when I was a child that jazz was actually in many uh, communist countries that time forbidden because it was very dangerous to know that no one knows what will be the end. No one knows who is going to work with whom and so on. So jazz was, of course, um, a very important message to the whole world. And also, um, I declared the International Day of Radio, which, of course, is about the importance of uh, free flow of information. And again, I remember very well in my childhood when I was listening to uh, Radio Free Europe or the BBC Radio or Radio Luxembourg, because in that time, uh, in my part of the world, it was forbidden. I don't know where you all have come from. We will talk probably later on. I don't know whether you have got a similar experience to me uh, uh, or not. I hope not. But still, there are many parts in the world who don't have the free access to information and who don't have the free access for the diversity of the expressions either. Um, so this is another kind of vehicle. We are doing our cultural diplomatic work with all the member states. Another one which you might know very well about is the UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, this is uh, one of the oldest conventions, and this is supposed to help to protect the buildings, the landscapes, uh, and we have a special convention which, through which we are trying to protect the heritage, the cultural heritage in danger, especially in the time of the wars. And of course, this is probably the most difficult task for us in UNESCO, because just think about Syria, what we can do there. But we, we, we are working um, uh, on the ground and very often unknown or unnoticed. Um, and actually, we have been working in different uh, political turmoils. I'm just telling you one interesting story. There has been going on a real war at the border of Cambodia and Thailand, and that was because there is the Previhir church, and both countries proclaimed that the church belongs to them. And actually, um, last year we had the World Heritage uh, committee meeting in Cambodia, and uh, me as president was invited to go to Previher, and I could not go there, because if I had gone there, then obviously I, how to say, would have given a strong message to the whole world that the church belongs to Cambodia. So we had to wait to the International Court of Justice, and by now it's uh, clearly stated that it belongs to Cambodia, but because of this very interesting relationship between the two countries and the two types of Buddhism and this very special uh, church, there has been going on a war because of that. So uh, uh, President Obama said that culture is what connects us. But um, he also said that, of course, culture is also what disconnects us and what, are, uh, what, what can be used for the cause of even wars. Um, another very important uh, culture convention for us is uh, the illicit trafficking. So we are protecting, of course, the artifacts from illicit trafficking, which has been going on as a big business all over the place. And um, 
there are results in that. For example, for example, last year in Cambodia, three very important pieces of um, beautiful Buddhas have been given back uh, by the Guggenheim Museum New York to, come to the Cambodian state, which have been smuggled out and deposited in this uh, museum for many years. And of course, we know that that kind of fight has been going on and on. So I'm going to see tomorrow here in Berlin the famous Egyptian queen's bust. And I'm sure you've seen it already. And of course, this we have experienced in our life many often, uh, many, uh, very often. And it has been going on today, on and on. For example, the Egyptian government comes us very often to ask for support because, of course, you know, you go there, you dig a little bit, and you find immediately something fantastic, and you just take it out. Uh, so we work with a lot of organizations, with Interpol and so on, and we are trying through this convention with the member states on the base of the declared, declared um, uh, collaboration to, um, to protect the cultural diversity, the cultural heritage, whether it is built or whether it's a landscape or whether it's intangible. We have got all kinds of other conventions as well, but I just wanted to give you a short introduction to the kind of culture diplomacy we do. And you, you, of course, don't have to think that this is just everything what is beautiful, what we do, because there are very strong political interests. Uh, there are very difficult parts of the world in the Middle East, uh, in Africa, and so on. And because of the political differences, or because of the wars, it's very difficult to work with these countries because everyone is sort of protecting its own country's uh, interest. But um, before I was elected as president of uh, the, the, the highest body of UNESCO, I was um, president of Group 2. And of course, in Group 2, you know, we have countries, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia, Georgia, just to name a few, which are in wars with each other. And I told them, you have to sit down with me at the same table. Because if we don't do it here at UNESCO, then actually we should just uh, forget about this organization. Because we know we have got our political interest, we have our uh, uh, different political arenas in the world, but actual culture diplomacy, the main point is of culture diplomacy is that it should be concerned about the people living on the ground in long term. What does that mean? It means, again, with a personal remark, that when I was brought up, it was this um, divided world, and of course we didn't have uh, in my country uh, in independent foreign policy, for example. Or we, we couldn't do any independent diplomatic word, work, of course. But the only thing what gave us hope was culture diplomacy. Because through culture diplomacy, we were able to, to meet other cultures through the art, through poetry, through different artists, and of course, not talking about the propaganda, but it was a great experience for us even just to go and to sit, let's say, in the British Council Library or, or not to mention other sort of free country representations. So culture diplomacy should be concerned about the people in long term uh, because if we are ready and good enough to build the bridges between the peoples all over the world, then we are sort of creating a new type of communication and a new type of dialogue. I have to tell you, coming to dialogue, that for many countries, dialogue is not what the Greek would think or what I would think about dialogue. For me, dialogue is that I'm saying 
something and then I'm listening to you or you are telling me something, I'm listening to you. And then we are discussing it. And in a real dialogue, someone or even more parties have to be able to change their perception or prejudices and have to be able to change their way of thinking or their standpoint. But for many countries, dialogue means that they speak and we listen. That is why I'm saying that the art of dialogue is something what is very important. The art of dialogue, the learning of dialogue, again, in our work in UNESCO, goes back already to the very low, um, low, low not low classic, not, not in, a, in a social science <laughs> uh, way, but to, to the early age in the classes because we have got a lot of programs and a lot, lot of competence building uh, uh, pro programs for people already in the schools to understand what is the dialogue. Just as we do, for example, in Africa, we go and teach and give the chance to women and girls to learn to write and read what would be normal for us, but it's not for them. Uh, through this special groundwork, what we've been doing, we are building these long-term bridges for understanding in the whole world. Uh, Elvira, I'm thinking, uh, I, am, I don't have to speak now about the art and culture diplomacy, do I? Or we will talk about that, yeah? Because you told me just to give a kind of introduction about UNESCO. Okay, and then just how we work politically. So there are the ambassadors of all the countries at the moment, 195. Of course, we have um, uh, other NGOs related to our work who can come and take part in the uh, general conference. Uh, what we have in every second year. In the UN New York, they have got the General Assembly every year. We have in every second year. That's why the president is elected only for two years, sort of representing and, uh, and, uh, and um, getting in dialogue with all the leaders of the world and talking about our philosophy and ideas and work. Um, and meanwhile, the General Conference uh, uh, is resting in a format, the so-called uh, Executive Board, in which we have only 58 countries, uh, monitor what the so-called Secretariat is doing. The Secretariat is, is the organization itself run by the uh, Director General, and it's great, we have a woman, a former uh, ambassador of Bulgaria, Madame Irina Bokova, the very first woman actually who runs UNESCO uh, since 2009. Um, what is difficult that we have the secretariat, they have to actually uh, um, work according to our rules, and of course there are all the member states monitoring but also influencing the world. So what do we have to do? We have to get in dialogue. We have to really find a consensus because if we don't find a consensus, the draft resolutions and the decisions won't meet anything. The decision that is the kind of uh, vehicle what we use for the political messages can be used only according to my mind if we can agree on that because otherwise, otherwise half of the world would consider it and the other half would not. I honestly and truly believe in the power, as I said, of multilateral diplomacy and the power of culture diplomacy um, because uh, it helps the people to think, to understand, and it goes right very often to the heart, to the psyche, to to the immaterial um, uh, experiences of the people. And uh, I always say that there is this beautiful uh, quote by Carlos, uh, um, uh, William Carlos Williams, uh, a poet, who said that actually um, you can't get news from poetry. 
but many people in the world die because of the lack what you can find in poetry. And I would like to finish my very short introduction, and uh, um, that was like a jazz piece, because I was told just to give you a lecture a very uh, few minutes ago. Um, I would like to uh, finish uh, with my thoughts, what I think about poetry. And poetry, and we can talk about later, as the other forms of art really are the vehicles uh, which can help us to build the culture bridges, exchanges, and sort of get uh, the people closer to, to each other. I think, actually, that uh, poetry can save us. Poetry can empower us to be daring, to be bold in confronting issues and crises. Poetry can save us because I cannot think of a stronger transformative force which reveals to us, though the medium of words and allegories are interconnectedness with Mother Nature. Poetry can save us because through poetry we can transform ourselves into compassionate beings. Poetry can save us because it can open up our minds through the use of metaphor by great poets to animate and popularize an idea, a vision, an understanding of the world. Poets who embrace the power of their language and imagery for the benefit of humanity can move mountains and topple walls both figuratively and literally. Poetry can save us because it elucidates a path towards peaceful coexistence. Poetry can teach us much about those who belong to different cultural or ethnic groups, their values, and their dreams. It is therefore an open door for dialogue and understanding between people. One of the effects of poetry is to change how we look at the world. When we read poetry, we are transformed into different beings, beings that have a higher awareness of the emotional, spiritual, and transcendental meaning of our surroundings. This phenomenon is very well understood by the poets who have for centuries used the power of the written and express word to motivate and energize civil movements. Poetry has transformed societies, overturned dictatorships, and brought violence to a halt, giving a real meaning to the maxim that the pen is mightier than the sword. Poetry is not static, but dynamic. It adapts to the changing circumstances and reflects the major developments and issues in the society. And poetry is inherently tolerant. Poetry is the very antithesis of tyranny and violence. Poetry epitomizes openness, it teaches us to value the freedom to praise and criticize. It has been called a powerful antidote against demons of power. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I brought these very short few words to you to finish my thoughts because I said these words uh, last year in March in Cairo. That was still in the time of the Mursi government. And they were not happy that I went there. I'm blonde, European woman, having kind of different attitude probably in life, talking about the empowerment of women. And uh, with Boutros Boutros Ghali, who used to be the Secretary General of the UN, we uh, had a great conference in UNESCO one year after the so-called Arab Spring, 
And I was talking about that we can measure the importance and the success of this Arab Spring only if we can meet the women who were then on the square. So anyway, I was not very welcome to Egypt. I still went there. Um, then they didn't want me to speak, but I spoke. And you see, I spoke about poetry. I spoke on the International Day of Poetry in Egypt. But through poetry, we were sending very strong political messages to the audience. The International Poetry Festival for Arab and European poets was actually organized by the people who were on the kind of opposition side of the government at that time. So it was a very hot uh, togetherness, uh, to being together. And after two days, my face as speaking this speech uh, in Cairo appeared on the front cover of the most influential, biggest paper, literary paper, saying in Arabic, of course, that this lady came here because she was interesting for looking for the truth. I was talking about poetry and it transcended and it, of course, was much more than about poetry. And that is why I think that the labyrinth, what we can, how we can use poetry, art, music for culture diplomacy is um, very sensitive, uh, very rich. Uh, you can use it in the deepest a dictatorship as well, and of course in, in a surrounding of free flow, flow information. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope that you will be interested a little bit more in UNESCO because it is a complicated organization and many people don't really understand what we do. But I assure you that what we do is really for the betterment of the countries, of the member states, and in long term of the new generations, and after all, saying this big word of humanity. Thank you very much.